Hallelujah, friends. Blessings and welcome back to High Kadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. And Jesus Christ is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And together the people of God lift their hearts and say hallelujah. Now we are continuing our study of the book of Enoch. And today we are in chapter 40 and we are going to read and reviews chapter 40 and 41. Now again, I have placed a link in the description if you would like to follow along with us for the book of First Enoch. And as I trust that you have that open before you and your Bibles, let's begin at verse 1 of chapter 40. It says, After that I saw thousands of thousands and ten thousand times ten thousand. I saw a multitude beyond number and reckoning who stood before the Lord of Spirits. And on the four sides of the Lord of Spirits, I saw four presences. I find that word interesting, presences. He doesn't say that they're angels. He doesn't say that they're spirits. They're just presences. They were different from those that sleep not. And I learned their names. For the angel that went with me made known to me their names. And he showed me all the hidden things. And I heard the voices of those four presences as they uttered praises before the Lord of glory. The first voice blesses the Lord of spirits forever and ever. The second voice I heard blessing the elect one. That would be Jesus of Nazareth. I heard him blessing the elect one and the elect ones who hang upon the Lord of spirits. Now, when it says who hang upon the Lord of spirits, a proper interpretation of that would be those who have been persecuted, tormented, crucified, for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so again in verse 5 he says, The second voice I heard blessing the elect one, Jesus, and the elect ones who hang upon the Lord of spirits, those who have suffered in his name. The third voice I heard pray and intercede for those who dwell on the earth and supplicate in the name of the Lord of spirits. Now friends, if we have seen several times in the book of First Enoch here, When you feel alone, if you feel alone, know that there are those in the heavenlies that care about your journey and love you very much, and they are praying on your behalf. First and foremost would be the Lord Jesus himself, for we're told in the book of Hebrews, he intercedes for us on our behalf. But here in the book of 1 Enoch, we've been told on several occasions that even the angels are interceding on our behalf. Why? Because of the next verse. He says in verse 7, I heard the fourth voice fending off the Satans and forbidding them to come before the Lord of Spirits to accuse them who dwell on the earth. Now in the Hebrew, this would be Hasatan, and Hasatan is really a title of an office more than it is a name. So when we refer to Lucifer, the fallen angel, As Satan, that's truly not his name. His name is really Lucifer. And so Satan simply is the name of an office. And what Hasatan means in the Hebrew is adversary. And if you and I have an adversary, what does that adversary most often do? They create problems for us. And most often they make false accusation against us to shred our characters and defame our names. And that's what Hasatan means in the Hebrew, adversary or accuser. And so it would appear that these Satans, because there are many of them that hold this office of accuser, they're constantly throwing accusation against us. And yet Jesus and his angels are interceding on our behalf to the Father, pleading our cause, and standing in defense for us. Verse 8, After that I asked the angel of peace who went with me, who showed me everything that is hidden, who are these four presences which I have seen, and whose words I have heard and written down? And so he said unto me, The first is Michael, Michael the archangel, mentioned to us in the Bible, and one of the four that we mentioned previously in the book of First Enoch. He is merciful and long-suffering. The second, who is set over all the diseases and all the wounds of the children of men, is Raphael. Now, Raphael is not mentioned in our Bibles, 
but he was one of the four that we talked about earlier. The third, who is set over all the powers, is Gabriel. Now, Gabriel, again, is mentioned in our Bibles, and he is one of the four. And the fourth, who is set over the repentance unto hope of those who inherit eternal life, is named Phanuel. Now, we haven't discussed Phanuel up to this point that I can recall or that I can go back and find. And he was not one of the four. In his place among these three would have been that of Uriel. Now, another thing that I should have pointed out much earlier is the names of these angels. Because anytime you see El in your Bible, like El Shaddai, Elohim, El is always the divine suffix for God. So these angels carry their name and at the back of their name signifies that they are agents of the Most High. We have Michael, we have Gabriel, we have Raphael, we have Uriel. A few chapters back, we had Zotiel. And even if you go back to 1 Enoch chapter 6, in verse 7, it says, these are the names of the leaders of the fallen angels. Many of these names end with the suffix El. Ramiel, Kokabiel, Tamiel, Ramiel, Daniel, Ezekiel, Barakajel, Asael, Zakiel, Turel, Jamjael, Sariel. And so God takes great pride in attaching his name to his servants. And notice what we are told in Revelation chapter 3, verse 12. Him that overcomes will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. He shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God which is new Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. Again, in Revelation 22, verse four, they shall see his face and his name shall be in their foreheads. I can guarantee you our new name will end with L because this signifies that we belong to the Lord God most high. Okay, chapter 41, after that, I saw all the secrets of the heavens and how the kingdom is divided and how the actions of men are weighed in the balance. Notice how it says the kingdom is divided. Why? Because of the fall of the fallen angels. And you'll hear people so often say that God is at war with Satan. That's not true, friends, because in order for that to be true, they would have to be equal in power. There's no war between good and evil. God is allowing evil to reign for his ultimate purpose. It's not for you and I to understand what that is. We are simply to acknowledge that he is the most high God and Lucifer is a bug under his feet. But for his purposes, he allows this to go on. Verse two, and there I saw the mansions of the elect. You remember what Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 2? In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Enoch sees these mansions. He says, I saw the mansions of the elect and the mansions of the holy. And mine eyes saw all the sinners being driven from thence, which deny the name of the Lord of spirits, and they are being dragged off. And they could not abide because of the punishment which proceeds from the Lord of spirits. And there mine eyes saw the secrets of the lightning and the thunder and the secrets of the winds, how they divided to blow over the earth and the secrets of the clouds and dew. And there I saw from thence they proceed in that place and from whence they saturate the dusty earth. And there I saw closed chambers out of which the winds are divided the chamber of the hell and winds, the chamber of the mist and of the clouds, and the cloud thereof hovers over the earth from the beginning of the world. And I saw the chambers of the sun and moon, whence they proceed and whither they come again, and their glorious return, and how one is superior to the other, and their stately orbit, and how they do not leave their orbit, and they add nothing to their orbit, and they take nothing from it. And they keep faith with each other in accordance with the oath by which they are bound together. Now, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because I certainly don't claim to understand what a lot of people try to tell us. P 
people who think that they're superior in knowledge to us, but what they're telling us contradicts not only the Bible, but it contradicts the book of First Enoch as well. Science tells us that the sun is stationary and the earth revolves around the sun. But that's not what First Enoch is telling us here because in verse 5, it says, whence they proceed and whether they come again. It's talking about the sun and the moon. And it says their glorious return. So they're on the move. Well, not only do we see this in the book of First Enoch, we also see this in the Bible. For instance, in Joshua chapter 10, verse 13 and 14, it says the sun stood still. Well, they're trying to tell us that the sun is always still. But in this particular occasion, God stays the sun so that the battle can ensue so that the people of God can be victorious. And it says the sun stood still and the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is not this written in the book of Jasher? Now here I am reading to you out of the Bible and yet this mentions a book not mentioned in the Bible. We're going to look at this after the book of First Enoch, this book of Jasher. It says, so the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and hastened not to go down about a whole day. And there was no day like that before it or after it. There's no day that the sun ever stood still before or after this event. After that, the Lord hearkened unto the voice of man for the Lord fought on behalf of Israel. We also see in Ecclesiastes chapter one, verse five, it says the sun arises and the sun goes down and it hastens to its place where it arose. And so obviously the Bible is telling us what science is not. And I'm just going to lay this out there. If science is wrong in that fact, and I believe the Bible over science any day, and I'm sure that you do as well. But if science is wrong about this, there has been an idea that has been presented over the last several years that the earth is flat. And scientists for only about the last 400 years have been telling us it's round but if they're wrong about the sun moving or they're lying to us about the sun moving, are they lying to us about a round earth? Because there's many passages in the scripture that make sense when you understand a flat earth. And I know that this may be throwing some of you and I certainly don't mean to do that, but look into it. I'm not saying I believe that the earth is flat, but I'm, I'm not saying that I don't believe it either. And when the Bible says that every eye will witness the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, that's somewhat difficult to do, even with satellites. That's somewhat difficult to do on a round globe. But if a flat earth is true and possible, it certainly makes all sense. Now, please understand me. I don't want to involve myself with conspiracy theories. But if you would be interested in knowing more about this topic from a biblical perspective, I'd be more than happy to do a video on that. Simply leave a comment below letting me know that you're interested. Because there are many passages in the Bible that do not make sense when we take the position of a round earth. But upon a flat earth, it makes all sense. For instance, that God has stationed the angels on the four corners of the earth. That now makes sense. But here, First Enoch, and as we saw in the Bible, it clearly tells us that the sun is moving. And there's only been one time in history that the sun has ever stayed still. And that's because God commanded it to stay still. All right, verse 6. And first the sun goes forth and traverses his path according to the commandment of the Lord of spirits and mighty is his name forever and ever. So the sun has a path. And after that, I saw the hidden invisible path of the moon. So the moon has a path and she accomplishes the course of her path in that place by day and by night, the one holding the position opposite to the other before the Lord of spirits. So if the sun is at the 12 o'clock position, the moon is at the six o'clock position and vice versa. And they give thanks and praise and they rest not. Isn't it interesting here how first Enoch tells us that the sun and moon give praise and Romans 8, 22 tells us, for we know that the whole creation groans and travails in pain together until now. So all of God's creation groans in pain, awaiting his return to set things right. But even through their pain, they exalt and praise the Lord Most High. Friends, we could learn from them. So it says they give thanks and praise and rest not, and for unto them is their thanksgiving rest. Verse 8, for the sun changes oft for a blessing or a curse. Now, we talked about this previously, how God uses the natural events of this earth 
for three purposes. You can find that in Job chapter 37, verse 13. So I won't spend a lot of time on it. And first Enoch goes on saying, the course of the path of the moon is light to the righteous and darkness to the sinners in the name of the Lord. Much sin takes place in dark places. And it was the Lord who made a separation between the light and the darkness. And he divided the spirits of men and he strengthened the spirits of the righteous in the name of his righteousness. For no angel hinders and no power is able to hinder, for he appoints a judge for them all, and he judges them all before him. And it's interesting, it says, no angel hinders and no power is able to hinder. There is no power in all of creation that's able to stop the hand of God, or for that matter, is able to move the hand of God. Look at what Romans chapter 8, verse 38 says, I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Or we could say is able to separate us from the work of God on man's behalf. No power, no angel is able to hinder, for he appoints a judge for them all, and he judges all before him. All will answer to the Most High. They may think that they have much power, that they may have much authority in this world that we live in, but every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. Every head will be hung low. Hands will be lifted in praise to the King Most High, the Lord Jesus himself. And it is at that moment that they will fully understand that all of their power, all of their fame, all of their fortune, all of their money will avail them nothing on that day. For every man will stand before him equal and each giving account of his own life for the works that he's committed in this world. Well, friends, that's going to bring us to an end of our study today. We'll pick up next time in chapter 42 of 1st Enoch. I'm so blessed and thrilled that you took a few moments of your day to spend with us this morning. I pray that your journey will be blessed today. But as in all things, we don't know what the next few moments hold for us. So no matter what happens today, good or bad, I pray that your hearts will be full of worship and your mouths full of praise, bringing him all the glory that he so richly deserves. Now, as Yahweh wills, friends, and until tomorrow, I love you, and I'll see you on the next video.